Hey, everybody, and welcome to this bonus episode of the Grow Leader Podcast. We're so glad that you're on board with us today. Before we get started, we do want to say thank you so much to the partners that help make this podcast happen. It would not happen without the Wesleyan Investment Foundation, Compassion International, or Great American Family Networks. We'll have all of their information in the show notes. We can't wait to get into this bonus episode. Let's get started right now. Welcome everyone to the Grow Leader Podcast, where we grow leaders that grow churches by helping them reach their full potential. If you're brand new to the show, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Matt, and I'm your host today. And with me, as always, the senior pastor of Church of the Highlands in Birmingham, Alabama, the chancellor of Highlands College, and just an overall amazing guy, Pastor Chris Hodges. Thank you. Thank you. you, I'm actually wearing my chancellor outfit today. (laughs) And I heard just this past week that some pastors call it the Birmingham Blazer. I love that. (laughs) So when they wear a jacket... On Sunday to church, they said, hey, I got my Birmingham blazer on because I'm one of the few that holdouts that are still like dressing up a little bit in church. So anyway, I'm wearing the Birmingham blazer because I've been in chancellor mode today because uh, we just came out of a chapel service uh, at Highlands College. It was spectacular. In fact, the person who spoke at our chapel service today is on the podcast today as bonus content. Bonus. This is a big bonus. That we're doing between our monthly podcast, leadership podcast that I do. So we have guests in town. We'd love for them to get on the show and bless the pastors as well. And we are here at the beautiful Highlands College facility, which I also have some great news to announce that you may have already heard if you've been following me on social media that we have an in-residence program here at Highlands College, which means I want the students around people who uh, don't just theorize about uh, ministry, but they actually do ministry. So we have an in-residence so that the best of and experts in certain fields come and, and, and give us entire days to be around our students, to teach them in small environments, teach all the student body, rub shoulders with the students, answer their questions so that our students know they are being trained by the best of the best. And we have people like C.C. Winans and Louis Giglio and Craig Rochelle, John Maxwell. That's a pretty good lineup already. That's an okay lineup. Yeah, and, and, and then just recently we have, um, we have uh, Chris Tomlin uh, coming uh, in February of two, t- 2023 to be an artist in residence to train. So great. In his words, the things he's learned about worship, who's really the best you would arguably say one of the best in the world in that area of worship to come train our students here at Highlands College. And I am so excited about that. That's a really, really big deal. And if you hear another voice, if you're listening on audio right now, you're like, who's this other voice that I keep hearing? That's our, our bonus special guest of the day and uh, Pastor Chad Beach. We are so excited to have you here with us. I couldn't us. keep quiet. I'm so excited about Tomlin. <laughs> I also really enjoyed the Birmingham Blazer joke. So I just couldn't. There's <laughs> not no, a joke, though. It's real. <laughs> yeah, it's real. Yes, yes. <laughs> And when you said the Birmingham Blazer, I thought you you still are the guy wearing blazers. Great leaders do frequently what the poor leader does infrequently. We got to get on your level. Right. We got to get the blazer going. And I think most of you guys know um, Pastor Chad Veach, dear, dear friend. Like we really consider ourselves friends. We hang out together in a lot of environments, not just at at, at ministry environments. Right. And in fact, we get you here uh, most every summer, your, your family vacations here to do some lake life. Yes. And, and we are very, very close. I have deep respect for, for Chad and the work that he's done with Zoe Church in the Los Angeles area. I, I consider you, my man, one of the l- leaders, um, uh, voices uh, to all generations and especially to uh, the younger generations. And so you spend a lot of time around our students, around our motion conference. And bro, I just love you. And I'm so glad to have you Thank here you. on the Grow Leader podcast. I love today. you. I love you so much. You know that. And every summer we get to go golfing together. So when I was dry, driving to Highlands College today, we we're driving in and I go, I know this road. I take this road every summer to play golf with PC. That's right. So we golf together and I just love you so much. I honor you. Thank you for who you are. It's bigger than the blazer for me. It's who you are. <laughs> That's Thanks. awesome. Thanks, my friend. I hope, so. I hope it's bigger than the blazer. <laughs> yeah. um, but I do want to talk leadership. You have your own leadership podcast. Yeah. And, and, and I, I listen to it regularly. Bro, you've been dropping some pearls of wisdom, and I particularly was intrigued by um, a thought that I want you to develop for our Mm-hmm. listeners, and that's imposter syndrome. Talk yeah. about that just a little bit. Yeah, I heard someone say recently, actually I got a guest on our podcast, his name is Colin Henderson, and he, does a, he has a book, he has a program called Master Your Mindset, and he really deals with this issue. He said 70% of adults in America deal with imposter syndrome. So they're image management experts. They're trying to 
you know, like pretend or trying to project a life that they know is that that's not who they are. And so they want to, you know, uh, uh, paint a picture. They want to come across a certain way. And they are mortified at being discovered of who they really are because they don't even like themselves. And I think that's, we got to live backwards. Like, I think leadership is going like the inner scoreboard matters more than the outer scoreboard. Mm. It doesn't matter. I think leaders are so results oriented, which is good. But if it goes unchecked, we're defined by attendance or following or finances, whatever, fill in the blank for you. But I always think leadership's backwards. It's always inner scoreboard stuff. Or for us as Bible leaders, you know, it's it man looks at the at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Right. So where am I living from? How do I get rid of that imposter syndrome? Of course, I want people to like me. I want people to accept me. So it's not like we're getting rid of social skills, but it's that my confidence comes from self-respect. Like if if I don't trust me, why would you trust me? If I don't respect me, why would you respect why, you know, so it's got to go from me first and getting confident and secure, which I, uh, here's another great thought he says. We are all dealing with trauma, drama, daddy, and mama. <laughs> That's great. And that will preach. And why are we dealing with imposter syndrome? Because we've got trauma and drama and daddy and mama, and we don't know how to sort that stuff out. So we just image, image, project, and we never deal with our real stuff. And would you say that it kind of goes both ways? It's it's the image that we don't want people to find out about. Yep. And then the image that we aren't, that we're trying to make people think we actually are. Totally. So when you're helping pastors, because I really want you to speak to this, and especially for someone who's um, that's resonating with as they're listening to it yep. in their workout or in their car or wherever they are listening to this yep. podcast, that really just, I'd like to take a minute and just kind of minister to the person who, yeah. who, who would say that. But I've always often said that if I could wave the magic wand and give leaders one quality, just mm. one, it would be security. There you go. It would be this, I'm, 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 I'm in my lane, I'm yep. comfortable with, with who I am, I, I'm comfortable with my voice, That's right. my calling. Yeah. I heard one, one leader that I deeply respect say, I'm satisfied with my portion. There you go. I know what I'm, my assignment is, and I'm not trying to do someone else's. So yeah. if you have somebody who is in this imposter syndrome, yeah. who is trying desperately, which is exhausting to, for people not to find out yeah. something, or they're desperately trying to help uh, people s believe something that's not there, what do you say to yeah. them? Yeah, well, I think a couple of thoughts come to mind. I think one of your lines, your authority is in your authenticity. So it's like, I'm a terrible version of you. Maybe the Birmingham Blazer doesn't fit, but I'm a great version of me. And I think, I also think about Paul. When you say that, I think about the apostle Paul. He said, I, I can't boast about a sphere of influence I don't have. So what I love about influence, the quickest way to lose influence is to not be aware of it. And then also to downplay it or to minimize it and go like, oh, it's not as big as so-and-so's. I always go, this, this is my portion. This is my personality. I'll never forget, I'm a pastor's kid, so one time we were on a mission trip in Mexico and we used to do these services before we go out and minister. I'm at the altar in the morning, you know, giving my life to God. This pastor comes up, lays hands on me. He said, Lord, I know you made this one different. I'm thinking, I'm going to serve today. What are you saying? And he, this guy, I'll never forget, he prayed over me and he's like, God made you with humor and you're a little bit different and you love joy and you love funny. And he said this, God didn't make you one way to use you another way. Wow. And I think we have imposter syndrome because I'm watching, a. you already said the names, Louie or Craig or Chris Tomlin or fill in the blank. And we're going, I have to be them. No, you don't. You need to be you. Your authority is in your authenticity. That's right. And people, listen, they will not tolerate a fake version of you but they will tolerate a real genuine version of you. And I think the more we can get secure, I always think like the two things come to mind. Awkward is a gift. So <laughs> if you feel like, man, I'm not like everybody else, that's, that's gift. You're, we don't need everyone to be the same. Right. We need some contrast. Right. So I always think like, even in our group of, of ministers, you, you know, you're friends with all of them. You've pastored all of us, all of my group of friends, people will say, you're different than them. I'll say, whoa, whoa, hold on. We're the same, but we're each different because we bring a contrast to the table. So if you're dealing with imposter syndrome, I will just encourage you to get secure and confident into that Psalm 139. I have been fearfully and wonderfully made. Find out your Enneagram, find out your strengths finder, find out who you are and get okay, you're an apostle or you're a prophet or whatever so it is, just be you. 
So good. And the podcast, you, you mentioned the, the guest you had. His What's name, the name of your podcast? My podcast is called Leadership Lean In. And the guy I'm talking about is named Colin Henderson. Phenomenal thinker. So good. And you just finished speaking to our students. So it's almost, uh, almost the opposite side of this coin. While we're being uniquely us, there's also some things that all of us need. Yeah. And I loved the thoughts you brought uh, to Highlands College today in the chapel of the seven things that every pastor needs. I don't know if we have time to unpack all of these. We actually considered making the whole podcast about these seven things. Unpack two or three of your favorite out of that talk today. Well, I'll today. just start with number one because it's my favorite one. That's a Bible. And I, it's, every pastor needs a Bible. Yeah, it just baffles me <laughs> that we have a lot of pastors. Most pastors, you know, they read the Bible to go like this: study, give it away. But we actually have to consume this content. We have to devour His Word. We've got to. I, I love when in Jeremiah when he says, "Is not my word like a fire? Is it not like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces?" There's so much rockiness in our hearts. Think about pastors. Pastors are disappointed depleted. We got our own brokenness. That word comes in. It brings a fire again, that revival. His word, it's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. I always hold on to Psalm 119 verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed according to your word? So you get all that ickiness and that junk in a pastor's life, and then you get up in the pulpit, you're trying to minister. No, you got to consume it first. We were talking out of Joshua 1, 8, one of my favorite scriptures, because every pastor wants to grow their church, grow leadership network, you know, but he, here he says, be prosperous and successful. How do we expect to be successful? So good. And not read the Bible. I, I, I don't understand it. And another one we're talking about is honor, which I think you master this and you can see it replicated all throughout Highlands College and Highlands Church, which is an old saying, right? You teach what you know, you reproduce who you are. And because you're a man of honor, that's reproduced. So I, I think that's unbelievable. We have pastors that criticize other ministers. Yeah. Think about that for a second. We have pastors who have been called to the harvest field that have their eyes fixed on the mistake of other leaders. I'm sorry. There's a Jesus verse that comes to mind and that's there's a log in your own eye. So it's like, let's get our eyes on the harvest and not on each other. And I'll say the third one that really stands out to me is excellence. And just being an excellent pastor Nothing worse, you go to a church and it's like, did you guys run through the PCO? Did any of the worship leaders memorize these lyrics? You know, did the pastor really know his message today or the parking lot picked up? Excellent speak. So those would be three that stand out to me. You know, as I'm around you, I wish everybody could get time to be around Pastor Chad. And I think there's such an authenticity and, and everybody can do that on stage. Anybody can pull that off for 35 minutes. But when you're, you're backstage at Motion Conference, hanging out with students or, or dream teamers or... Um, just, you really love people. I mean, you genuinely just love being around people. And uh, it's, it's just crazy that as pastors, as ministry professionals, that we can get so far away from the basics uh, right. of, of our Bible and prayer yeah. and authentic relationship, which is where security and um, authenticity, everything that we want for our ministry, yeah. it all comes from the simple places. And uh, I was just looking at a room full of Highlands College students and thinking about, man, I know guys that are my age, my, my, my friends that are campus pastors with us here at Highlands and even other people that are senior pastors, this is the message for them and for all of us right now just to be reminded of and come back to. So just how, how does that play out in your, in your, your daily life? So what are some of your daily disciplines that, that keep you grounded to because the Word? Because that was one of your great points as well. I think they were all really great. In fact, we need to get this message to all of our campus pastors, the ones that weren't already at the chapel service, but you spoke a lot about daily disciplines as well. Yeah, it's it. Well, think about it. When God put a king... In, in, in the Old Testament, when God is set in a king, he prescribed daily Bible reading. He said this daily discipline, they'll re read and rewrite the law every day. He's, think about this. He said this daily discipline, so it wasn't weekly, it was daily, will allow them to not let their hearts be lifted above their brethren. So translate that. You get really prideful and really self-righteous and really arrogant without the Bible. Wow. So it's a, if, so I was like, if God did that for the kings in the Old Testament, he did it for pastors in the New Testament. We gotta be in the word. So I think just going back to your, to your thought about, you know, not, people not having a love for people. I was raised by incredible parents. 
They loved people. They loved pastors. There was always a pastor in my house that my dad was restoring. Somebody around the dinner table, they had a whoopsies or a, <laughs> they needed a mulligan. And, you know, my parents were always getting a guy back up on the, uh, off, you know, off the mat. And they showed me what a love for people looked like. And I think I heard a pastor say recently, he's like, this is so funny. Think about where pastors are at. He goes, Jesus died for him and I can't stand him. And I thought, well, well there we are. <laughs> Jesus died for him and we got a lot of ministers that can't stand the people. And I, yeah. and I think wow. if we fall radically in love with Jesus, he will always bend the arrows of our heart out towards others. Wow. It can't, it's impossible for it to not happen. So if, this is First John, right? If you say that you love God, but you hate your brother, you've never seen God. Right. When I see him, he gives me a burden for others. So good, so good. One of your points was also on prayer, and you just released a book about prayer. I want you to talk about it. I want you to promote it. I, I believe in it. I've got one coming out myself yeah, in January. January. I can't wait, and I'm all about it. I think we need a prayer revival in America. Absolutely. Honestly, and this is not about book sales. This is about... Yeah. We need revival, and there's never been an awakening, an awakening or a revival that did That's not it. begin without united prayer and the church praying. That's so it. talk about your book. You know, all of it started, um, I don't know if you've been to this church. I think it's called Su Presencia in Bogota, Colombia. So they asked me to come do a Wednesday night, and uh, so I flew down, to, and I'd heard great things about this church. And the Wednesday night service, it seats, you know, I think 3,500, 4,000 in the main room. And then they had three other overflows of 800, 700, I think 800. And there's a 5 and a 7 p.m. service. So we do the 5, it's unbelievable. I mean, just the glory falls. It's just like crazy. In between the services, the pastor says, hey, let me show you the overflow rooms. So we see the first one where they have live worship and then, you know, you're streamed in video. So we see the next one. And on the third one, we're kind of high up, like kind of like today when you showed me the, the top floor of this, of this amazing building. And he said, hey, come over here, look out the window. And looked out the window, he goes, look down the road. And as far as I could see, like ants, there's people lined up. He said, all those people are waiting to get into the 7 p.m. Oh, wow. And I said, I said, sir, what are you doing that we are not doing? And he said, well, I think the secret to our church is every Tuesday and Thursday from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., our corporate church prayer happens, and this thing is filled with as many people are here tonight. Tuesday and Thursday morning, before the people go to work, we come together and we pray for one hour. And I was moved, and God really spoke to me. That's where this whole book comes from, is this moment. Wow. God moved in my life, and he, and he reminded me two times that God moved in revival times in my life were both birthed out of prayer. When I got saved in high school, I went back to my high school. Nobody knew who Jesus was in my school, went to a public school. And I started a prayer meeting with a buddy the first day of school my senior year. Two of us went into a classroom. We ate for 15 minutes. And the last 15 minutes we prayed. First day, two. By the end of the week, four. Two weeks in, 10. Wow. Pretty soon, 10, 20, 30. Now we got to go to a choir room, 40, 50. 100 kids by the month of March. I would stand up in my public school, 2,000 students, stand up in my lunchroom my senior year, and I'd say, all right, after 15 minutes, come on, 100 kids would go to the gym and pray. And we saw kids delivered. Wow. We saw kids saved in my lunchroom. I we, believe it. We have yeah. nine pastors in full-time ministry. And God reminded me in Bogota, hey, where did your prayer go? And there was another time God moved in my life, but I just, I, it just stirred in me. We need to be praying What's the name of the book and what's the thesis? Give us some of the nuggets of truth that, it, that people are going, wait a minute, I've never heard that about prayer. Yeah, it, it's called Worried About Everything Because I Pray About Nothing. <laughs> and that's just a play on Philippians 4, that's of awesome. course. But, it it um, speaks to your personality too. I love it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It, I love it. It, it, just, it just need to be um, people of prayer. But I wanted to write, um, not prayer for dummies, but I feel like so many people, it, it's this arduous, difficult, I can't, Shame is such a bully. So a lot of people don't pray because they don't think they're good enough and they don't know how to. So one of the things I talk about in the book is like, this is a practical I want you to be. If you're not good at prayer, start a contact in your phone and call it God or Jesus and start texting your prayers. Wow. Another thing I write about is like, if you're not good at prayer, set a, an alarm in your phone at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 6 p.m. And when the alarm goes off, I want you to stop and say the name of Jesus at nine and 12 and six, and just say his name. Just that prayer, just prayer brings God awareness. 
It's that old line. Prayer doesn't change things. It changes me. Right. It's like when I leave prayer, I'm encouraged and I'm excited. I got peace. I got purpose. I got the right premise. And my problem is still there. Same bank account, same hospital room, same relationship, same situation. My prodigal's still away, but I got peace now. So I just, I so love good. the power of prayer. So good. I'd love for you, I'd love for you guys to get the book. Uh, just go to Amazon or wherever books are sold. Check out the book that Chad Veach wrote on prayer. We have a couple of minutes left. I'd love to talk about the series uh, that you're in right now at the yeah. church. Uh, ex- explain to us what it is. And you were very excited when we said, hey, we want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, this is it. You know, I've been saying every week in this series, Acts 2.42, if you can apply this verse, you know, James, don't be hearers. You have to be doers of the word. The application of Acts 2.42, and they, so you got to get a group. You got to find your spiritual tribe. So good. He sets the lonely in family. Find your group. Find your they. I, I, when I was a youth pastor, people used to get mad. Your youth group's clicky. Yeah, God's into clicks. <laughs> He made tri- 12 tribes in Israel. So that's fine. Find your they. Find your group. Find your role, dogs. You know They devoted themselves. You got to live a devoted life. A lot of people want fruitfulness without faithfulness. They devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted their lives to so these good. things. And I, what I've been really excited about is this idea of breaking bread. Okay, so Bible reading, get out of here. I'll talk about that all day long. I love about prayer, get out of here, the best. This is just the meat and potatoes of our <laughs> faith, right? But that breaking of bread, my concern for a lot of people in our churches these days, I used to be concerned growing up is these folks don't have friends that don't know Jesus. And now my concern is these folks don't have friends that love Jesus. Oh, wow. I think the tables have turned. I think the influence is greater outside than inside. Wow. And I'm concerned about our people getting around tables and uh, crying together. I asked Dr. Henry Cloud, I know you love yep. Dr. And we were golfing the other day. I said, hey, wh- wh- why are we seeing this with pastors these days? What's going on? This is so good. Only Dr. Henry Cloud would have this insight. He said, the problem is most pastors, they have never cried in front of a small group. So they've never gotten vulnerable. Hmm. They've, never, they've never been in community. You think about the loneliness. You know, le- leadership is loneliness. I'm sorry, brothers and sisters. It's as lonely as you want to be. You're only accountable as you want to be. If you want friends, you got to be a friend. You want authenticity. You got to be authentic. So good. I just think there's something about that breaking of bread to not talk about sports or culture or politics or the weather, but can we please break bread and get past surface level Christianity and talk about our faith? So one, good. One of the last parts you did in the series, um, Symptoms of the Saved, which is just, I mean, you're so good at titles. Like oh, the, the sermon titles are so great. Um, what are some of the, so, and the whole premise is, if you've caught something, if you've been infected with something, it should show up in your life, right? Yeah. There's going to be some symptoms of that. That's right. What are some things, um, some symptoms of following Jesus that need to show up more in leaders right now uh, in this period of time in our country? Yeah, you, you just watch the effect. So we look you know, from 42 all the way to 47, you see the effects of the, of the application of this verse. One of the things that stands out to me the most and one of my concerns amongst church leaders is that they, they found in this, in the, I think it's 44, says they found common ground. Mm. And we live in a polarized nation. We live in, with polarized churches and church leaders. And I think we've got to get away from the lie and we got to get into the truth. We've got more in common than we do in difference. You know, we're the beautiful body of Christ. And we can't let hands say to eyes, we don't need you. And eyes say to foot, we don't need you. We need each other. And I think when you, when you walk out this verse, you find, what do I have in common with them? And you, you stop being so prideful and arrogant. And you start walking in that humility. I think, by the way, this, this is a great thought for all leaders. Louis Giglio, I was with him recently. And he was, he, we were leaving lunch. And he grabbed me and said, hey, he got really serious with me. He said, I want to encourage you. Go low. And you know, anything he would say, I would say, yes, of course. And so (laughs) I just kind of nodded. He's like, no, no, no. I really want you to go low. Like, go. And he gave me some ideas for me of what that practically looked like. Go low. I think if you apply Acts 2.42, you can't live with a haughty spirit. You find that common ground and you go low. We need more pastors mm. that are walking in a spirit of humility. It's an incredible series. Anywhere you can find, uh, you know, development, leadership development, I think is such a part of who you are and something you're passionate about. And so whether it's picking up the new book, um, help, 
uh, Work With People. Uh, it's just such a great book, whether it's a podcast, Leadership Lean In is awesome. I just sent uh, three days ago, uh, Get It Done Leaders, the way you said it. Get, get her done. Get her done, which plays in Alabama. We, <laughs> we can do that. We're so grateful for you, and thanks for being here, investing in our students today. It wasn't just the students. It was also our staff team. We are grateful for you. Uh, thanks so much, Pastor Chad Veach and Pastor Chris Hodges. It's been a great bonus. This is a great bonus. Great bonus. We'll see you on the first Monday of next month on the Grow Leader Podcast. Grow Leader.